I got to work with Robin before Robin became a big star. He was doing stand up with a, a group called Off the Wall in Los Angeles. And he asked us all to come down to the comedy store on Sunset Boulevard because he needed an audience there because he was auditioning for a show called Mork and Mindy. So we all went down to watch him and help him out. And he was fantastic as usual. And obviously the rest is history. But I used to work with him, do some improv with him. And then doing the improv with Robin was, you were basically a prop. <laughs> and it was very hard to get very hard to get a word in there. <laughs> I'm Peter McCulley. That's Jan Rabson of Salt Spring Island. We'll chat about his voice being heard on everything from The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and Burger King commercials to Minions, Toy Story, and even characters in video games when Today in BC continues. From the latest community news to informative, entertaining reads for travelers and the cannabis curious. Just visit your local Black Press Media community newspaper website to sign up today. Thanks for being with us today, Jan. Oh, my pleasure. Good to be here. You've been in movies and TV shows, which we'll talk about, as well as what goes into developing a career as a voiceover actor. What was life like for Jan growing up in East Meadow, New York in the 60s and 70s? East Meadow was developed, the Joseph Martin Estates started East Meadow. It was like Levittown. If you know what Levittown was, it was cheap housing for the returning soldiers from World War II. And in East Meadow, they took uh, potato fields and took away the potatoes and put cookie cutter houses. Now some of them have columns on them. <laughs> Amazes me. Yeah, and they little tiny little backyards and all. But the difference between us and Levittown is we had basements. So that was the big deal. How did you become interested in acting and voice work? I think part of it was my dad was an accountant, and he would drive into New York every day. It was a good half hour each way, except when traffic got worse as years went on. And he had a lot of small clients, small businesses, mostly immigrants. He had his office in the basement of the house. And so they would call I'd answer the phone, and it would be, Hello, this is Mr. Del Boisio. May I speak to your father? And I would say, Mr. Del Boisio wishes to speak to you. And I'd get a laugh and then obviously encouragement. And uh, so that's how I started, yeah. So you were a mimic? Pretty much, yeah. Oh, I, listen, I, I've been a mimic since. That's part of a big reason why I'm in voiceover and how I made my living for many years. About 10 years, I'd say, easily. Universal would hire me at least once, twice a month. I go in and myself and another guy, we'd replace all the voices for things that were going on TV or onto the airplanes, all the curse words. So that's what we did. We'd sit there and just replace everybody, mimic the voice. That was a nice steady gig, yeah. And so, fun, a lot of fun. So you would have to be able to mimic quite a wide range of actors. Yeah. Luckily, the clips were short enough that I didn't have to retain the voice. it will be one or two words. You can hit it close enough that they can futz it a little bit, but you still had to get it pretty close. So I used to do a lot of impressions. Now my impressions probably it would sound to everybody like old. Oh, Sinatra. Yeah. I remember. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's Frank Sinatra Jr. Yes, yes. Is he still alive? I'm not even sure. I'm not sure either. We're too old to know. Exactly. <laughs> We're getting a tiny bit ahead of ourselves because I wanted to ask you about in your 20s, you just packed up and moved to Los Angeles. Did you have some connections there, some friends there, some family there, or did you just wing it? I, it's a combination of many. Here's what I had. Honestly, it's funny, Peter, asking this. I haven't thought about this in years. I was working for Eastern Airlines. One day when I worked at Eastern Airlines, this guy went through and I opened his bag and it had, now this is 1976. So marijuana was not legal at all, especially on an airline. And this guy had some marijuana in there. I didn't see a gun or anything. And I closed it back up and I saw it, it, he worked for Paramount Studios in LA. And so I took his name and I took his number and I called and I said, we found your bag. I just have to tell you I had to open it up to make sure it was okay. And it's on its way. Good luck or something like that. And I said, by the way, I'm an actor. I'm coming to L.A. So he said, yes, we'll set up a meeting with him. I had my father's friend, cousin, was a famous composer of music. I had his number. So that's two. Mel Blanc. I'll t should I tell you my Mel Blanc story? Oh, please. The man of a okay. thousand voices. Yes. When I was about 15 or 16, I wrote Mel Blanc a letter. And it 
said, Dear Mr. Blank, my name is Jan Rabson. I do over 100 different voices, and I crossed it out. I wrote, this is a boring letter. <laughs> and underneath, I wrote, Dear Mr. Blank's secretary, or whoever screens his mail, my name is Jan Raps, and I do over 100 voices. I wrote, this is even more boring than the first letter. And underneath that, I wrote, Dear cleaning woman, or whoever finds this crumpled up in the <laughs> wastebasket. And I wrote the letter. And he was sweet enough to write me a letter back that said, and I wish I had it still, it disappeared. Dear Jan, the cleaning lady showed me your letter. <laughs> <laughs> so I had him, he said, come out, he'd meet with me. So I had those three people. And I had a 1962 or three Ford or something that was squished. In, my cousin sold it to me. It had an accident. It was beat up in the front and the back. It looked like a little accordion. And it drove that across country. Yeah, I'd been out there. I was worked for Eastern Airlines. You got a free trip if you got a letter from somebody that said, thank you for whatever help I did. And people would always tell me, oh, can I give you money? You can't tip me. But if you wrote a letter, that'd be sweet. And nobody ever did. So I wrote my own letter. <laughs> and I met with Mel, you know, which was great, I met in his office. And I was so broke, I slept on lawn chairs in Beverly Hills because I figured that's, I was supposed to sleep in a better place. <laughs> and I decided to move out and I drove out there, yeah, with nothing. And the, the uh, composer said to me, when you're established, call me back. Boom, nothing. Mm -hmm. Mel got me with an agent. So that was huge. He got me with an agent. That was like the first, because he, oh, here's a story, actually. You okay, Peter? Okay. I had an ex-girlfriend's aunt's phone number, her aunt's phone number. And so I gave it to him. He said, I'll listen to your demo tape. If I like it, I'll call you. If not, I don't want to feel obligated. And I was, you know, okay. And I was on the Santa Monica Pier because I had nowhere to go. I was just like roaming around. <laughs> I had no place to sleep. I had nothing. And I called her on, a, remember the old pay phones? I called the aunt. I said, any messages from me? And she said, no. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, some guy named Mel Blank called. He said he loved your tape. And I just exploded 12 feet off the ground. So that's what gave me the impetus to come out. And I drove out. And the Ford Accordion? Yes, in my Ford Accordion. What was that? It was a, not a Ford. It was a Chevy Nova or the car lasted, honestly, it lasted maybe a few days out here. I remember I rented a room from this guy, got on the driveway, and the car just went. Ah. <laughs> 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 and died. And that's it. <laughs> so Mel Blanc, the man of a thousand voices. Yeah. Conservatively. I loved everything about his voice. I loved just even talking to him because when you talk to him, you can hear it a little bit at Bugs Bunny. You know, how are you, Mel? Oh, I'm good. I just did a bunch of cottages. And that's how, you know, it was great. But one thing he told me very explicitly, he said, don't do my voices. He said, do your own. Mine are taken. Of course, after he died, everybody copied his voices. I never went on those auditions. I didn't want to do it. He was like a second father to me, frankly. I used to speak to him. Easily once or twice a month. How you doing this and that. I loved him and he was a great guy. Yeah. Did you ever get to work together? No. Never once. I worked on things he worked on, but never in the same time. Never once. That's an interesting thing about being a character voice actor is that you're in a booth by yourself a lot of the time and never meet the other people who are actually working on the movie. Other than the producer, maybe. Many a time, yeah. It's interesting. I've had dialogues with a lot of people that don't know me. We worked together, but you weren't there. So did you have a favorite Mel Blanc character? I loved all of his stuff. He brought such life to every character. And that's what's funny about today's thing. It's like they say, oh, I can hear that's him doing the voice or this or that. doesn't matter. Mel Blanc, you could hear that was him. You always heard him behind me. There's like a little bit of Mel in every voice. But still, it was just the, the personality and everything was just fantastic. You were also on the Carson Mighty Players on The Tonight Show for a number of years. Now. It's funny how it came to me. It's just, again, all my stories can't be short, can they? <laughs> I don't know. If, no. hey, we got all kinds of time. <laughs> okay. Here's what happened. I did a Honda commercial. That was just me being this very neurotic guy. And it really was very popular. It was supposed to go a national but they decide, I love this quote, this is a quote from the ad agency, 
they felt it was too hip for the Midwest. So it, it didn't run there, but it ran locally in LA and in a lot of different places. And friends of mine, and here's an interesting little talk about pathos. My dad died a day before that spot, but it was a weekend. So I couldn't contact a company and say, hey, I can't show up for your million dollars you're spending on this spot. So I did the spot. I went back, buried my father, went, did the spot, and then went home again. And I just concentrated that day, just uh, by laser sharp on whatever. And it turned out to be a very funny, great spot. And buddies of mine who were the head writers on the Carson show, for years were trying to get Johnny either to have me on as a guest to just talk about the little voices I've done and never could get him to say yes to any of the spots or anything. And finally, they said, hey, the guy in that commercial... And he said, oh, that guy. Yeah. And boom, I was hired. <laughs> yeah. And those, I, I would like to do a shout out to them. Nichols and Vickers, a writing team, they're Canadian boys. And they're just the best, such loyal, wonderful friends, great, talented guys. So on The Tonight Show, you played everything from bit parts, walk-ons, maybe policemen or whatever it happened to be, to actually creating sound effects for typewriters and calculators and all of that. It sounds like you had a lot of fun. I personally was a big fan of the show, and it seemed to me that every once in a while, everybody just went off script and ad-libbed, and that seemed to make it even more fun. I'll, t I'll tell you two things about that. One, I never did bit parts, because what happened after Johnny retired, Jay's people called me and wanted to hire me as an extra or a bit part. And I said, God, I couldn't do it. They wanted me to do Rod Serling, which I did a huge amount of, so I lost out with Jay. But... With Johnny, Johnny would say before every sketch, don't ad lib. And I would nod. I would ad lib. And I'd get <laughs> hired the next time. So apparently it worked. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but I was a member of the cast. So I think when you see all the ad libbing and that kind of stuff, that's the really off the cuff ad libbing was when they were stars working with him who were either flubbing their lines or whatever. I could ad lib to some degree. My restraints were a lot more than, say, uh, Tim Conway. But it was a ball, Peter. I got to do. Everything from my favorites were when he would do the phone thing at the desk spot and he would call a number and we would be either an answering machine or something like that. Usually myself and a female partner and we'd go back and forth or whatever. And I just had a ball because it would be everything from an Arab prince to a, a German fuel general. It was great. You mentioned Rod Serling. I haven't heard your Rod Serling. Wow, man, I haven't done it in years. I did it probably easily on three or four sitcoms and movies, and I was actually in Houston at some convention they had me. I was the only approved Rod Serling impersonator by Mrs. Serling. <laughs> <laughs> My claim to fame. Let me see. I'll try very quickly. Let me see. Witness, if you will, one Peter McCulley sitting by a microphone in a room by himself in... The Twilight Zone. Very it's good. It's been a while. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Maybe you could indulge us with a Carson story. You worked together for a long time. There must be some stories that stay with you, but one you could share with us. That's Well, it's funny because he was not that kind of guy. We would rehearse. We didn't clown around. He was a very private kind of guy. And the only thing I can say is I worked on one of the last sketches he ever worked on. And it was the glue sketch. It was a very funny, wonderful sketch about a guy, the guy who invented super glue, dies. So, of course, everything we touch sticks to us. But I was supposed to be out there, and he was done at that point. We would rehearse, and luckily I get paid for rehearsals. I'd, they'd have me come in, and we would rehearse a sketch, and he'd say, nah. I'm like, I can't do it. He was done. I could tell. He was tired. He was some funny sketches. He'd just say, no, I can't because he couldn't put this thing over there very easily. And so this was the last one. And I got out there. I'm out there first. And he's supposed to come out. And he has the first line. And I'm waiting for him. And I'm waiting. And I'm waiting. And I look. And I see in his eyes this look of, I don't want to be here. <laughs> my my. My heart just went down to my toes. That was the last one. But he was great in it. It was still fun, but he was done. He just didn't want to do it anymore. He was tired, I think, yeah. That sketch happens to be on The Best of Carson. Oh, um, is it? Really? Yeah. Oh, it was a fun, fun sketch. I don't know if, if you've seen it or not, but at the end, my part, 
and I'm supposed to walk off and the wall is supposed to come with me. So I'm standing there, I'm trying to get the damn wall to stick to my back and it won't. I walk off and it looks so stupid because it's supposed to be a laugh. You're live in front of an audience there. And so granted, if something major happened, they could shoot over in this. But I, let me put it this way. In any of the sketches or shows that I've done with Carson, never did they stop and retape. Mm -hmm. It was all, that was a made a mistake. It's, that's what happens, yeah. Live to tape. Shall I assume, since you were working a lot of the time on the Carson show for a, a period of time, that you had time during the day to go out and find jobs, go to auditions for episodic TV shows and movies? Because when I look on your IMDb page, there's a ton of them. Yeah, I was a working actor. It's that simple. And I was not a star by any way, shape, or form. I was a guy, like in baseball, I hit maybe 240, 250. But I was good to have because I could play infield. I could be in the outfield. I was a good, useful player. And the Carson show, what would I do that? Maybe once a month or something. Maybe twice a month, whatever. And it was a nice gig because I'd come in. They taped them, I think it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It just worked out. You'd have an audition, you have agents and people maneuvering to say, he can't come now, can we fix that and move that there? But people would ask me what I did for a living, and I told them I was a driver. I would be driving in LA from one studio to the next, sitting like crazy, trying to get through traffic for the next <laughs> 1 o'clock gig. It's, that's what I did. And now we have the internet, and you can sit at home and do it. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. When I first came up to, to Vancouver, they wouldn't let me mp3 my auditions over there they wanted me to come in to to fly in just for an audition i suppose you just need to hear me you don't have to really i'm not that good looking <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, the honda commercial you've done some tv commercials that have been national like burger king and at the risk of a bad pun is that kind of the crown for a voiceover guy <laughs> burger king was a uh, voiceover so that's the difference i stopped doing on camera i forget when at some point i just i'd had enough because i didn't like there's a lot of sitting around <laughs> i'm not good at that i'm too fidgety and it was before the internet so you'd sit around you had a book you could just read or draw or write but one of the big spots i did was an apple commercial that was an on-camera commercial for the new mac and that was supposed to go international it was national. I think it may. It didn't do the Super Bowl yet, but it was supposed to go Super Bowl. It was supposed to go international. They had people from every country in the world there at this spot. There were 400 extras in this spot and me. That's, I had a guy sitting next to me. I was standing talking to this group, and he was sitting down. And every break, he would go out and smoke and come back. And it would be like having seven cigarettes. I said, to him, wear a coat, do something. <laughs> Just you know, I couldn't. <laughs> Yeah. I'm standing there smoking. <laughs> but the spot, it didn't go international because at that time, Apple stock dropped like a bomb. I forget what happened. But just my luck, it just, <laughs> shoom. And so they took the spot off the air. And that was that. Yeah. Quick stories and impressions or observations about some of the people that you might have worked with over the years that our listeners would be familiar with, especially in episodic TV shows like you made some appearances on Knight Rider with David Hasselhoff, who's still like a, isn't he a huge hit in Germany? He's a big rock star in Germany. Yeah, big rock star and a sweet guy, a really very nice guy. And yes, I did Knight Rider with him. And in Knight Rider, I played a cowboy, maybe miscast. I don't know. But the producer of that show that cast, she was fired. That episode was just one of the worst. I had not that I know Knight Rider that well, or there is a good or bad episode. But this was one of the worst they ever did. For some reason, the main character guy, he couldn't do it. So the guy that filled in. How do you uh, cue cards the entire time? <laughs> hey, Knight Rider, I see the. <laughs> Did he hold and, the uh, cue cards for the car? <laughs> no, the car. I don't think I met. The car wasn't in any of my my episodes. But Hasselhoff is six foot five or six or something, and I'm five nine on a good day. And so we had this scene where I come at him, and he's supposed to grab me by my shirt. And we rehearsed it, grabbed him by my shirt. One, two, three times, he tossed me around. Then a punch, I rolled back, and I fall back down, and then boom. And it's almost lunchtime. So the rest, okay, let's get this one done. He grabs me, six foot five, grabs me by the shirt. He grabs me by my chest hairs. 
<laughs> and he's swinging me around. The pain in my face is so beyond real. <laughs> oh, the tears in my eyes. <laughs> and he, he does the punch. And I fall back down. No stuntmen. They're supposed to be there to catch me. I'm lying there. Lunch. And everybody goes. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, actually, I work with Hasselhoff on Baywatch as well. Here's my cute little Baywatch story. I'm not a diver. <laughs> I have never been underwater in that sense or scuba even I can do a little bit. So I had a wetsuit because we were shooting by the Santa Monica Pier. And believe it or not, there are stingrays under your feet when you're in that water standing there. So this is concerning to be doing your lines and knowing that there's two or three divers down there with spear guns to protect you. It's a weird feeling. <laughs> they gave me a wetsuit and I put it on. I usually I try to stay under the radar and nice and quiet. I don't like to complain too much about things. But I had to, and I went into the wardrobe and I said, I'm sorry, this thing just is not fitting me at all. And they said, you have it on backwards. <laughs> <laughs> had to do it. Cheers. With Ted Danson, I think, is going for the record of most TV shows, longest on TV. I played not the coach as your coach. I played a baseball coach in a TV commercial that Ted Danson's character was in. Yeah, he's a very nice guy. It was a great atmosphere. It's funny, you walk on some sets, and there's just a feeling there, that of camaraderie and niceness. It's really a pleasure. And then there's some other sets you walk on, you can just feel this icy, cold, kind of weird thing. Maladies not meshing. It's strange, yeah. That was a fun set. One of my favorite comedic actors in the 80s was John Larroquette, was on Night Court. I believe mm -hmm. you made an appearance in Night Court. Yeah. That's interesting, Peter, from what I was just saying. <laughs> I'll say this because out loud, because he's not, he can sue me or do whatever he wants. I don't care. He was not very pleasant. No. I, I worked night court about nine times. I did that night court. I think two or three on camera and another five or six voiceover. And again, I get, it was fun because I get to do some guy yelling from the background, whatever. Or, you know, I once was an alien dressed head to toe in tinfoil. <laughs> that was, but it was a fun, fun show to do, and everybody else was great. But Lara Oquette never even acknowledged that I was there. Wouldn't even look at me to nod, say hello. And after nine times, which equals, let's say, nine times five, 45 days of being on a set, you think somebody at least give you a little nod. So I found him not very pleasant. But I don't know, maybe he was just going through some times. You mentioned there's the great set and then the cold mechanical set. So what's, in your opinion, the best set that you ever walked onto? I'll tell you, it's not the best set necessarily because it wasn't TV, but for film, one of the most fun things, I think, when it first started was when Pixar started with Toy Story. And I got to work on Toy Story 1 and 2 and all their shorts. And working with Pixar then, it was this young, fun, new company the first day when I came home, I said to Cindy, my wife, I've just worked for the new Steamboat Willie. You know, what Steamboat Willie was to the 20s, 30s, this is the newest thing. It was just so crazy. And John Laster was so much fun. And the way we worked, we were looping the film. And normally you loop a film, you do all the voices, this and that. But it was so different the way John had us do it. He really had us pick out voices and audition for voice. It was beyond fun for so many years working for Pixar. That was a great set. When Today in BC continues, Jan Rabson talks about creating character voices for animated films and video games. Hey, it's the Moj, Bob Marjanovic. Join me on the Moj on Sports podcast on Black Press Media at todayinbc.com. Listen into conversations with well-known athletes and celebrities as we look behind the scenes at these successful people. Listen in to the Moj on Sports podcast on todayinbc.com. You'll also find the Moj on Sports podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, YouTube, and Google Podcasts, as well as mojonsports.com. Today in BC is a Black Press Media podcast. We're chatting with actor Jan Rebson. Jan, you had the opportunity to work on a few movies, one being Crimes of Passion, starring Kathleen Turner. And when we're talking about recognizable voices, as I know you listen to voices, she had the female voice of the 80s. Oh, yeah. She had more bottom to her voice than I think the Titanic. Was she the one that was in Romancing the Stone? Or yeah. Romancing the Stone with Michael Douglas. Yeah. And friends of mine were writing on the follow-up. And the one thing that Michael Douglas asked him was those scenes where he had a carrier. 
Because she's a, a larger... <laughs> also, uh, you were on the set of Fatal Attraction as an extra. Well, here's the deal. First of all, I'll tell you this. It's interesting because on whatever you may have gotten it on, I did extra work only two times in my life. What they write there, sometimes they get it off a crawl. And I may have done a voices on that. And then they write extra in there. I was on both... Are you ready for this, Peter? Okay. <laughs> Are you sitting? <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> That's good. There were two fatal attractions. One was a Canadian fatal attraction. That fatal attraction had a similar story to the Michael Douglas one. And it was, again, in the 80s somewhere. And I was hired to replace the voice of the main actor in that one. Because, let's just give you a reason why, there was, say, a scene they showed me. And he was supposed to throw this woman onto the piano and then he rips off her dress and he jumps on her. And it's very dramatic, macho. They wanted this macho kind of guy. Good looking guy, the actor. Except when he said, so I'm just going to rip this off. And it didn't really fit what they were looking for. So I replaced him in the entire film. So a couple of years go by. Adrian Lyne, director of Fatal Attraction with Michael Douglas, is casting for a scene where Glenn Close is on the phone and looking for Michael Douglas's phone number. And so Glenn Close's voice is already in there. It's already filmed. And I have to, or whoever he was going to hire, has to go in between those lines to make it work and sound. And he looked all over Hollywood for a lot of, he wanted a man's voice, a lot of people, and nobody got it. Now, here's what I found was interesting, was that I decided, because everybody's going with it, oh, yeah, here's your number. I said, where's your number? What's your problem? I got hired. And so it was interesting that I replaced a guy who sounded like that, and I did it in the new one. You're talking about uh, replacing actors' voices in lines of movies. Have you ever done any female characters? Yes. I'm not replacing, but I've done two female characters in my life. One of the ones that I did that was a lot of fun was Mulia mild and that is a mule on my little pony and she's a cook and so she sounds a lot like yes a lot like julia Julia. but my name is mule (laughs) (laughs) so she was a lot of fun to do (laughs) you must be fun at the supper table yeah (laughs) i get a lot of shut up dad Over the years, there's been lots of actors whose voices make the character for the TV show and or the movie, and then they get animated work and and stretch it. I'm thinking of two in particular, Don Adams from Get Smart, because he became Inspector Gadget, and Robin Williams, who became Aladdin. Did you get to work with any of those types of actors? I got to work with Robin before Robin became a big star. He was doing stand-up with a, a group called Off the Wall, in Los Angeles. And he asked us all to come down to the comedy store on Sunset Boulevard because he needed an audience there because he was auditioning for a show called Mork and Mindy. So we all went down to watch him and to help him out. And he was fantastic as usual. And obviously the rest is history. But I used to work with him, do some improv with him. And doing the improv with Robin was, you were basically a prop. <laughs> and it was very hard to get very hard to get a word in there. <laughs> what is the secret to improv? You've worked in improv, done improv, taught improv. What's the secret? How can you keep all of that in your head and react so quickly to what somebody gives you as a situation? I think that's it. There's nothing to keep in your head. It's really like the conversation we're having now. Except that whatever you give me, I try and make it funny and try and make it go someplace. Try and make it, for me, I try and make it bigger than real, more fun than real, more more out there than real. It's like somebody who can play an instrument. I can't pick up a clarinet and do that. But for me, it's easy. I wish I had a secret. Are there brain yeah. exercises to keep everything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll tell you, Peter, for me, that's what I love about improv. And frankly, improv was really key in my career. It got me a lot of jobs, a lot of gigs. And all this Pixar stuff that I did, and all, a lot of that was improv. And people don't realize how difficult it can be to speak for, say, over two minutes just on something and pretend or whatever. Imp- improv served me very well. You get a call, Jan, I need a voice for an animated cyberpunk action film, <laughs> which will be called Akira. And it goes on to be one of the most popular anime films of all time. Oh, yeah. So I had no idea that there was a controversy 
I guess I did mine in 89. Yes. And I think there was one done in 90 or 92 or 91 or something. And that there's a controversy, which is the better Akira? So I'm not going to say. So when the producer calls you and says, we have this character, do they have a preformed notion of what that character will sound like? Or do you create that? Or how does that all come about? The answer is yes. Because what happens is sometimes the production company, because it could be one person, it could be a whole group of people. Sometimes you're dealing with just a casting director, or sometimes just a director. And so you're meeting that front line of person. I was once on a set and the producer heard me kidding around with somebody with a voice, said, why didn't you audition for us? I said, I did. But she never heard the voice because the casting director said, oh, I'm not sending that one in. So you never know. So sometimes they know exactly what they want. Sometimes they let you play around and hoping that you'll find something and bring life to it and make it easier for them. So there's a myriad of things. And sometimes it's very specific. No, we'll sound exactly like this. Sometimes, ah, play with it. Let's find something. Let's talk about some specific characters then. Toy Story. Yeah. Jeez, what did I do on Toy Story? My kids always know what I did. Oh, I was the army man. On Toy Story 2, I was the Japanese guy who bought the uh, the uh, soldiers on the phone. That was fun. Yeah. So really, for that one, it was supposed to be a Japanese businessman on the phone. And I just decided to make him very high and excited because he was buying these toys. This was great. So Simple as that. Simple as that. It really is. You were on the uh, Secret Life of Pets? Yeah, yeah. That was the one where I was one of the toys in a group psychiatric session. <laughs> so you didn't have to step too far away for the part, is that what you're... No, not at all. Listen, <laughs> I was right. I was lying down doing it. <laughs> Minions? Everybody knows Minions. Yeah. But what a lot of people may not realize is that on the Minions, all the Minions are done by the director. He does all of them. I played bad minions who were evil minions. <laughs> so you could do that, but he does all the minions. That's him. It's funny. He's a really nice guy, too. Very talented, yeah. Monsters, Inc., the sushi chef. That mm-hmm. was fun. I did him, and he's got only a couple of lines, I think. Humans are here or something like that. I forget what. But then he went on to play to be on about two or three different games. They hire you back. All of That's what's fun about Pixar. You're sitting there and mind your own business. Say, oh, remember you did the sushi chef? They want to make him a game guy. Boom. It's fun. Wally. Wally. Oh, that was a lot of snoring. I remember there were <laughs> all that snoring. Yeah, I did a lot of snoring on that. Large people snoring. <laughs> cars. <laughs> cars. Well, cars. Gosh, we did a lot of the little mechanics and things. But then on cars, they did a cartoon series. I think we did. 20 some on episodes on that and I got to do everything and that was a lot of fun. The thing that caught me about Cars when it came out was that it obviously was different because it was Disney Pixar it had a different look to it but they had Paul Newman playing a lead character. Yeah, yeah. That gave a lot of credence to the movie right away. Oh, I'll tell you it's one of the reasons why I left LA. Honestly, it used to be the cartoon voices anybody could do them. And then it started celebrities coming in and doing these voices. This was like our meal money. This is what we paid our rent with. And for them, it was like beer money. And they come in, it was fun. Hey, I got to do a cartoon today. I got to get taken away. It is what it is. It's everything evolves. But I remember one of the last shows I did before I left Los Angeles, I was sitting next to the guy who played with Indy in Indiana Jones. Okay, Indy, let's go get them. Remember, he was a big, yep. you know, yes, India. <laughs> and he was a very nice man, wonderful man. But we sat there before the session started. It was an animation, I think, for Batman or something. And he leaned over to me and he says, I've never done this before. What do I do? <laughs> I thought, come on. <laughs> That's not fair. That's <laughs> You've done some voices for video games, which is a huge big thing that I've never gotten into, but I'm sure you're... Your kids are into video games. You've done some characters there? Yeah, I've done a whole mess of them. I guess the most done, like I say, with Pixar, done a bunch. But the most well-known character I've done is Leisure Suit Larry. As my wife likes to say, she married Leisure Suit Larry. That's- <laughs> He's that famous? I don't know. God, we've done, I think we've done at least 10 or 12 games. I don't know how famous he is. I think he's more infamous. It's a smaller group of people, 
who will admit to knowing who he is. And then there's people who know who he is, but may not admit. And there's a lot of people who don't know who he is and they're very and well off. Do you watch or listen to your work? I've talked to lots of actors who do not. It's not that I'm not interested. I think, yes, maybe I'm not interested. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, if it comes in front of me, I guess I'd watch it. I don't usually seek it out. There's so many things I haven't seen that I've done. And that is a lot of it because you do it in March and it doesn't come out February of two years later. Have you ever and, done an impression in front of somebody and maybe you didn't even mean to do it? And how did they receive that? The, Two were not famous people that I did it in front of that I had reactions from. And one was my neighbor who was from Argentina. I did him in front of him one time. And so he was, how shall I say, not happy. <laughs> he was not happy that I did it. So that's <laughs> my, my uncle Saul Rubin was from Russia and he spoke with a very particular way that he would enunciate his cadence very unusual and so I did one time my father said to him Jan does an impression who is this <laughs> I did it for him and my uncle Saul looked at me and said Nixon speaking of Russians for films I had to replace a Richard Dreyfus in a film, John Candy, whose laugh I still remember. <laughs> but but I replaced him. But in between, and it's funny because in between replacing them, both those things, a call came on the session, and John Candy's brother replaced me replacing him, and Richard Dreyfus's brother replaced me replacing him. <laughs> yeah. One of your neighbors and a very good friend was a broadcaster and author, Arthur Black. Did you two ever have the opportunity to work together? We uh, not only worked together, but Art became one of my best friends here on Salt Spring. I loved the guy. He was a great guy. And we did work together. We would always volunteer and do readings and stuff at different places to work together. But I produced, and you were in one of them, if I recall, some radio dramas here live radio dramas and art was kind enough to be in i think i did it three times he was in all three yeah and he was just a pleasure to work with do you have any words of wisdom for those trying to break into the entertainment business today if you don't have to do it don't but oh, it's funny i look back and again i wasn't a star but i made a good living and did some good stuff and proud of my career but god was i stupid i was 23 years old i go out there thinking I'm going to make a living at this. And it just, it's so darn difficult. I'm so lucky and fortunate and I don't know, conniving and whatever I was to get where I am. It just, it's a tough road to hack. And I guess if you're going to try to do it, just, you got to keep your spirits up and keep looking to the future. That's a tough gig. I'd like to thank Jan Rabson for being with us on this edition of Today in BC. If you have suggestions or comments, send a voice message to podcast at blackpress.ca. You may be part of our podcast mailbag segment. You'll find Today in BC podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and Google Podcasts.